Legs to hold you close, but never hold you near. Your grandma understands. Hello, if you're new, welcome to Four Waller, and if you've returned, welcome back. Here we talk about true crime, so if that's your thing, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and that way you'll be the first to know when the next weekly story is dropped. That said, you ready? Today we are going to a wee place called Speck, in Liverpool, England. This is where we meet Robert John Maudsley. It's the 50s. Life's not easy in 50s Britain. It's still coming to terms with the debris left from World War II, as is many other parts of the world. Robert is just a baby of around nine months old. He has three older siblings with only a few years between each one, two brothers and a sister. His mum's name is Jean, dad's George. Both parents being brutal to their children, neighbours thankfully complain to social services that the kids are being treated badly and not being looked after. Under a parental neglect issue, all four children are taken away. They'll be taken to Nazareth House, an orphanage ran by nuns not too far away in Crosby. The kids like life here and are relatively taken care of and allowed to be kids without getting a beating for it. By the time Robert is roughly eight or nine, elder brother Paul is wanted by a family for adoption, but the biological parents must be asked first for permission. The nuns will ask George and Jean, who say no and that in fact they want all their kids back. It's been nine years, but they are given back. The kids being away for this many years don't really know their parents anymore and because Robert was a baby, he doesn't know these people at all. They're literally total strangers to him. And the brutal mistreatment resumes and their life becomes very hard to bear. Here, they will be beaten, hardly fed, locked in bedrooms and have only coats to cover up and keep warm. Abused all over again, especially by Dad George who seems to save the worst beatings for Robert. Once, his dad ran into the room with a cocked air rifle and broke it across Robert's back. Another time, Robert recounts he was locked in a room for six months, his dad only coming in to beat him five or six times a day, every day. Over the years, they will be joined by eight other siblings, bringing the household to 14. It will come out in later years that Robert is also sexually molested as a child. At 18, Robert runs away. In fact, all the three brothers will run away, not really knowing where the other is. Robert will head to London with hopes of a better life. Anything must be better than the one he has but he struggles on his own and invariably gets into the wrong crowd being sexualted by an associate. Robert turns to drugs to numb all the psychological pain and finds himself becoming a sex worker to help feed his drug habit and, well, just to eat. In 1974, now 21, he gets picked up by a guy looking for sex. This man's name is John Farrell. After a time in the car, the man pulls out photographs of children, telling Robert they were pictures of all the kids he's molested. This confrontation with what he now knows sitting beside him as a pedophile makes Robert see bright red. He takes off his belt and garrots John Farrell to death there and then in the car. Minutes later, he walks into the nearest police station and hands himself in, telling the officer at the desk that he's just killed a sex offender and that can he now get some help. When the police find the victim, he's the colour blue and very dead. And for the first few years of incarceration, Robert is actually nicknamed Blue because of this crime. 
At court, Robert pleads guilty and deemed unfit to stand trial. He's sent to Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital in Berkshire. Although he likes Broadmoor and is treated fairly well, three years in, in 1977, Robert and fellow inmate David Cheeseman will lock themselves away in a cell with another prisoner, a well-known pedophile named David Francis. They will brutally torture Francis for nine hours straight, smashing his head off the cell walls many times, cracking his skull open and shoving a spoon so far in his ear, some brain is removed. Although not eaten as was wrongly put in the newspapers following the incident. Even so, he was now dubbed Hannibal the Cannibal and transferred to Wakefield Prison in Yorkshire with a further conviction of manslaughter. He doesn't like Wakefield and makes it clear he needs put back in Broadmoor. His pleas go unheard. In 1978, he will kill a further two prisoners. First, William Roberts, serving seven years for the rape of a seven-year-old girl. Stabbed to death with a makeshift knife, then stuffing the body under his bed. Leaving the cell, looking for another victim, inviting random prisoners to come with him, one inmate said, you could see the madness in his eyes. No one was silly enough to take up the offer. He finds Salney Darwood in his own cell, who's serving life for the manslaughter, rape and brutal domestic violence against his own wife, Blanche. Stabbing him to death with the same makeshift knife, then calmly walks into the screw's office, places the knife on the desk and says... You're going to be too short for roll call. Now deemed too dangerous to be among other prisoners, in 1983, a specially crafted cell is built for Robert Maudsley in the basement of Wakefield Prison, something that has never been done before. No other prisoner, in Britain at least, has ever had a cell specially built for them. It has thick, bulletproof glass walls is slightly larger than an average cell. The two glass compartments stand at 15 feet by 18 feet, has a table and chair made of compressed cardboard and the bed base moulded to the floor made of concrete. It has a toilet and wash hand basin bolted to the floor and a solid steel door that opens into a cage compartment with a letterbox type slot for guards to stand in and pass food through and such like. He's observed 24 hours a day and gets one hour exercise that is chaperoned by six guards. So just to put this in some kind of perspective, Peter Sutcliffe, nicknamed the Yorkshire Ripper, didn't get treatment like this. Myra Hindley wasn't treated like this, nor was Ian Brady. In 2000, Robert asked for his solitary confinement to be relaxed or to let him commit suicide via a cyanide pill, which he will administer himself. He's sick of living in a glass coffin, as he calls it, which in effect it is. He's unsuccessful in this plea. Nowadays, he's allowed some TV, loves David Attenborough wildlife programmes, art, poetry, classical music, and regarded as funny and highly intelligent. Only three people are granted access to see him, and that's his two brothers and his namesake nephew, Gavin. He likes to call him and his brothers the Three Musketeers, as they called themselves in Nazareth House, the place Robert says they were last altogether happy. And Gavin is allowed to be D'Artagnan, since he's now in the mix. In a letter to his nephew Gavin, referring to him and his two brothers, he says, We do try and have a good time when the three musketeers are together. 
That goes right back to the 1950s when we were all together in Nazareth House in Crosby and at least felt safe from physical harm. And to us, it felt like our home. And whilst there was no physical, tangible love, we were at least clothed, fed, dressed to a degree and able to act like children and not be punished for it. Nazareth House was the last place for us where we were all happy together. At the time of this posting, in the year 2022, Robert John Maudsley has spent 48 years in prison, 40 of which in solitary, 39 years in the specially built cell, and since Ian Brady's death, he is now the longest serving prisoner in Britain today. I mean, in my opinion, surely this is against some sort of human rights, surely. Right then, thank you so much for coming to see me. This is my wee time out. Please be kind to the person beside you. We're all human, including Robert Maudsley. Your grin of understanding hangs like flowers in her hall. And her life seems so demanding. She's just gone out with it all.